Warning. This episode contains strong language. The second thing you need to know about me is nobody owns nobody owns me, right? All of my contributions come from individual people. I have very tiny fraction of my uh, my contributor uh, of my campaign fund has come from um, political action committees, and they're not even corporate PACs. It's one union PAC and a couple of what they call aggregator PACs, right? They're just just collecting money from a bunch of people and spreading it to a bunch of candidates. So, you know, a tiny fraction of one percent of my uh, campaign funding comes from PACs. Ninety-nine point nine percent comes from individual people, just like you, Mister Undecided or Mrs. Undecided, um, and. As I said back earlier in the in the in the cast, if you want to know who your representative in Washington is going to work for, look where the money's coming from. My money's coming from people like you. That's who I'm going to work for. Welcome to the Lone Star Play podcast. I'm your host, Patrick Scott Armstrong. Join me and a famous guest every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. We discuss their career, life, food, Texas, and everything in between. Let's get started. guys, and welcome to the Lone Star Play Podcast. I'm your host, Patrick Scott Armstrong. All right. Mm. We got a great episode today. We are talking to Rick Kennedy. If you remember the last episode, we talked to Mr. Pete Sessions, who was running in the 17th District of Texas uh, for a congressional seat. Uh, Mr. Rick Kennedy is the other candidate. So you've got the, uh, we had the Republican candidate on. Now we've got the Demo- uh, Democratic candidate on. Um, a great conversation. And look, I, you know, again, I got a full disclosure. I, I am a registered Democrat. So this conversation may seem a little easier for me, to be honest with you, um, than maybe the one I had uh, with Mr. Sessions. Um, but just different. But both great. They're both, both good guys in the sense of, you know, just being able to talk to him. I, I really liked Rick a lot, um, to be honest with you. He's got a real good outlook on things. He's got a, you know, logical sense towards things and how they work and um, what he says makes sense. And, and, you know, for me, Um, so I did agree with him on a lot of these things. And and again, it's not my job to agree or disagree, but it's a podcast and this is what we do. So, um, but again, I always try to keep it fair and open and no matter where you stand, hopefully the right questions are getting asked. So um, it was a great conversation. Again, if you're an undecided voter, I think it's well worth listening to this and the one with uh, Pete Sessions, and you can make a decision uh, for yourself on who you'd like to vote for. So, look, it's a it's an important race. It's important what's happening right now. So, th- I feel that these are two very important podcasts. To be honest with you, well worth listening to. And again, no matter your pil- political affiliation, they're each uh, worth listening to. So. I want to thank um, Mr. Kennedy for coming on and as well as Mr. Sessions, both of them for coming on and being willing to, uh, you know, discuss the issues uh, with our with with me and, you know, hopefully give our listeners something worth listening to. So, again, thank you guys so much for supporting the podcast and supporting us. We're going to continue to bring on uh, as many great people as we can and have all these great, open and honest conversations. Remember, doesn't matter which side you stand on. This podcast is for you. OK, I promise. Um, I try to be as down the middle as I can for everybody. So, um, again, cause I'm not the only one working on this podcast. There's a lot of us and there's a lot of different viewpoints and that's cool. I'm all about different viewpoints. It's my favorite part of having the podcast is, is literally talking to people with different viewpoints. It's my favorite part. So again, as long as it's in a respectful manner, I will talk about anything just about that is the truth. So just about, all right. So again, thank you so much for supporting us guys in the podcast. If you have any questions or concerns or want to learn more about us or, you know, past episodes, don't forget to go to our website, thelonestarplay.com as well. Don't forget to check out our YouTube page where we do break down these episodes into clips. So, and you can find the full episode obviously on there as well, but you can obviously see uh, the clips that we do on YouTube because again, we film this as well. So you can see the person we're talking to and you can see my beautiful ass face as well. Okay, I'm, you know, I'm gorgeous, guys. If you're not watching this on video, you're really, you're really missing out. Just telling you. <laughs> All right. Okay, enough of uh, me talking about me, um, which is my favorite thing to do. Just kidding. Um, all right, so let, 
Good God. I, this is what I do, right? I babble, guys. Sorry. Just hashtag babble. That's what I do. So let's get to the episode. Rick Kennedy. All right. Enjoy. Hello, sir. Hey, Patrick. How are you doing? I'm doing fantastic. How's your day going today? That's a little nuts. <laughs> <laughs> You yeah, I would imagine. Expect. <laughs> yeah, t I can't even imagine your schedule, to be honest with you. Yeah, you know, I'm one of the very few um, <clears throat> candidates for United States Congress who actually still works for a living. So um, <clears throat> I, I backed it off to 20 hours. I'm, I'm lucky enough to be able to do that. But even so, um, trying to wedge in 20 hours of, uh, uh, of professional work alongside the campaign. It, and it's more the context switching than anything else, right? You know, sure. just get your head out of campaign mode and get your head into into work mode. It's just, it's crazy. <laughs> oh, okay. I, I'm, I would imagine they bleed in uh, to each other, right? <laughs> they do. Uh, in, in, they do indeed. Yeah. Well, listen, I, I really appreciate you taking the time today, uh, Rick. As you know, uh, we had uh, Pete Sessions on earlier. And um, yeah, so I was really excited to get uh, the other side of the coin here. And just full disclosure, just like I told Pete, um, I am a registered Democrat. I did vote for Biden and Harris uh, in this election. So I just made that clear at the beginning uh, when I spoke with Pete as well. And same thing uh, with you. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm really excited to talk to you uh, about, uh, yeah, about what's going on. Um, th this is a crazy election. Everyone is talking about it. Uh, you know, it's very highlighted uh, for sure. And um, yeah, I just want to start a little bit with um texas so just we're gonna put politics aside just just for a moment here just nope. get to know get to know you a little bit rick so sure. you know tell us a little bit about your relationship with texas were you born here you grew up here that that sort of thing just just kind of tell our listeners yeah neither of those i was uh, i was actually born in massachusetts and and grew up there um and um, didn't discover texas until i was 44 years old uh it was about 15 years ago close to, close to 15 years ago now my um oldest son at that point was uh just about to enter a school system um my wife now my ex-wife um we were we we knew we wanted to move to a warm weather state um and we wanted to get there before um uh, before he went into a school system so we uh we took a weekend trip to uh to austin just to check it out uh we knew we were impulsive so we we we, we set boundaries for ourselves we weren't going to look at houses we weren't we were just going to check out the town and see what it was all about uh and we weren't on the ground here 36 hours before we had a real estate agent and um <laughs> <laughs> we 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 left uh, uh you know we we left on a sunday we had an offer down on a house here on a tuesday we had our house on the market by that wednesday and we had it sold by the following saturday because this was back in 2006 when the real estate market it was before the the big crash of 2008 yeah. um i'd love to say that i i saw that crash coming and i had the wisdom to uh, take my equity out of a house up in uh, massachusetts and move to a a lower cost market but no like a lot of things in my life it was just dumb luck and um yeah we've been putting putting roots down here ever since that that oldest kid who was going into uh into preschool um back in 2006 he's now a sophomore up at baylor and wow. um yeah, I know time flies, nice. man. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> and my uh, my girls, who are actually over in the kitchen over here doing their remote schooling, they're in their junior and freshman year uh, in high school here in uh, in Round Rock ISD. So, um, you know, my 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 relationship with Texas is I always tell people because you know when you go into politics in Texas, right? If you weren't born here, people hold it against you, right? I always tell people, look, you don't get to pick where you're born, but you do get to pick where you raise your family, and as a fully cognitive grown up i chose central texas to raise my family um and you know we love it here we love everything that that drew us here in the first place uh is still here um the political environment of course is is brutally divisive but it's like that everywhere in the country so um you know I, Texas doesn't. Uh, Texas isn't special in that in that respect, uh, but everything that we loved about Texas, the the livability, the affordability. We got good schools. We've got you compared to New England, we've got 
brilliant roads. I know people compare, people are very uptight about traffic in downtown Austin and rightfully so, because you try to, you know, you get north or south of the river one way. If, if you have to cross that river, you're in trouble. Um, yeah. But um, it's still nothing compared to uh, um, what you face up in, up in the Northeast or some of the uh, more congested areas of the country. So we love it here. Um, I always tell people um, that they'll only take me out of here in a body bag. So, um, you know, you, know, you, you can bury me where the ground doesn't freeze, and that's in Texas. <laughs> I love that. Uh, look, I wasn't born in Texas either. Um, I'm as Texan as they come, so screw anybody that says uh, you're not a Texan <laughs> if you weren't born here. So my brother wasn't. My mo- no, In fact, nobody in my family was born uh, in Texas, and we're all Texas. So, um, no, that's great, uh, Rick. Um, you know, y- you came here. You know, like you said, you, you made a decision. You started a family here. Yeah, that's a ridiculous notion as far as uh, Texan goes. It, it's such a broad term. Uh, you're here. You love the state. You're, you're raising your family. Plus, you've been in that same district, right, where you're running. Have you been there the whole time, 15 years? I, yeah, we've, you know, I've, I've lived within probably a five-mile radius of where I am right now for the last 15 years. Um, obviously, with a divorce in the middle, there's been some moving around and things sure. like that. And, of course, here we are in Travis County. Um, I've got one person, uh, you know, who's who's in my district who uh, a couple months ago, actually many months ago, and I was pre COVID days, but at an event came up to me and said, Rick, when we walk our dog, we cross three congressional districts. <laughs> it's like <laughs> it, it's so split up around here. You know, it, it it almost doesn't matter. You know, for a while I lived two miles outside the line. Right. So it, it hardly matters where, you know, from a strict in the district outside the district um uh standpoint you know you're here you're you're in central texas so yeah yeah that that's a good point well i know people were making that point about pete being you know coming down from dallas and he's coming back and um you know that sort of thing and and i'm sure he's touting the and he was you know my my family's from there and and that's all great and i i understand that uh the Mm -hmm. history there of the city so uh but i think as if you're a resident all you're gonna all your concern would not be what has happened in the city but what is going to happen in the city absolutely so that that would be my concern um so yeah let's talk a little bit about first of all you know the debate the first presidential debate was last night i mean not not the first one I, yeah you know what it, it really was the you're first actually, one actually you're correct you know, it was. yeah yeah <laughs> it, it kind of was the first one you know coherent yeah. uh conver- look I'll, I'll 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 give donald trump some props here in the sense that at least th- there was conversations happening and debates yeah. i could tell he was holding himself back from interrupting and i, I think the the mic muting of the two minutes each candidate was was great. I, I I wasn't too happy about that to begin with, to be honest. But once it happened, once I saw it in in practice, uh, it worked out beautifully. Uh, and the moderator did a phenomenal job, uh, in my opinion. So yeah, I'm just curious of, of your opinion of, the, of, of that. And and I'm also curious, how does that affect your race, if it does at all? Um, <clears throat> I don't think it, uh, you know, I'll answer your second question first. I don't think sure. it directly affects my race in that I don't think anybody who watched that debate flip their vote from Pete Sessions to Rick Kennedy or Rick Kennedy to Pete Sessions. Uh, you know, we're, we're, I don't even know how many days out we are. <laughs> what are we 10 days, nine days out, something yeah. like that. Uh, it's all a blur. And um, um, at this point, the vast majority of the people have already made up their minds. I don't think that debate last night really changed any minds at the presidential level, at the top of the ticket either. Uh, it was informative. I, I agree. It was, it was night and day compared to the first debate. Um, Mr. Trump was obviously far better coached. Um, he was far more disciplined. He was far more restrained. Um, and, um, you know, he did a much better job of stating his, uh, his positions and his outlook. Um, the fact checkers went nuts, of course, uh, as they always do. There's plenty of <laughs> plenty of fodder there for the fact checkers. There was a lot of uh, disinformation flowing um, uh, from that side of the uh, of the of the auditorium. But um, he did a far better job as far as demeanor and presentation goes. Uh, he did he did not swing my vote, <laughs> shall we say? Um, but and I agree with you. The moderator she did a fantastic job uh, compared to the other, both the vice presidential and the first um, uh, the first presidential. Um, uh, debate, but quite frankly, they gave her some ammunition too with that mute button. So That's they true. knew they were on a short leash. So they yeah. they 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 behaved themselves. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, that, that's definitely a good point. I, I think the number one thing I liked about the moderator, well, two things. One, I didn't really notice her. So that was a, a 
plus to me. The second one was that I liked what she did would she would say, okay, she let everyone f like finish points and come and respond, but she did it so masterfully, to be honest with you. She would say, yeah, okay, go ahead and respond, but then we're going to talk about this. Exactly. And, and laying down that what's coming next sort of thing, I think really, really yep. helped um, keep it going. So she yeah. Set a, yeah, she set boundaries very clearly and then she enforced them. So she did a good job. And I agree. She was far more transparent than, you know, the moderator in, in, in one of these debates should be like the referee crew at a football game. Right. Exactly. If you don't even know they're there. Then they've called a good game. Right. Yeah. And yeah. And, great point. You know, it, 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 if you leave the stadium talking about the referee crew, you know, something's wrong. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, yes, uh, big time. If they're if they're the if they're the clip that they show on Sports Center, right? That's not good. It's never that's right. It's never a good thing. And you know what? Let me extend that. Government should be the same way too. It should be almost transparent in your life, except when you know that big fight breaks out on the football field. You want the referee crew to take control. When a global pandemic breaks out, you don't want a big government that's intrusive in your everyday life, but you sure as hell want a government that's capable of a competent uh, and coherent response when there's something that threatens the lives and livelihoods of 330 million Americans. So there, I say, I, I, I said it. <laughs> uh, uh, agreed. I, I think yep. uh, most people agree that, I mean, that's a statistical fact uh, that most people agree with that. Um, so look, uh, Rick, I'm a little curious about um, th this is kind of something that's been coming up in, I would say, the last four years or so. And it's this idea of funding the elections, of how sure. elections are, are actually funded, right? Yep. So I guess, l let me just stay from like, uh, which this was you before, right? Just a normal guy working, doing your thing, yep. right? That's that's me right now, right? I'm not running for anything, but this is how I see things. This is how I talk with my family, my friends, right? So the idea that being... You know, a politician can only get money, you know, from a certain, you know, place, right? Or the politician can get money from anybody and everywhere, a company, right. a, a, a lobbyist, right? Super PACs, whatever, whatever you come up with. I'm curious what your thoughts on that are. Public funding of elections, I guess, is, is the best way to put it. So especially in the House of Representatives, our elections are um, phenomenally rigged um and you know i'll use the word president trump uses the the the, the house of representatives elections are, are rigged um cook political report um analyzes all of the of the districts uh and they've only they, they recently redid their rankings their, their assessments uh and they estimated that or they decided that only 13 percent of all congressional districts were actually competitive so out of 435 seats in the House, only a little over 50 or so are actually com considered competitive. The rest are either so gerrymandered or just so so self-sorted into Democrat and Republican um, that one side or the other really doesn't stand much of a chance, right? And what happens in those districts, because, and I'm firsthand experience, right? Because I'm in a, what Cook calls an R plus 12 district, right? It's, it, it's heavily um, gerrymandered to elect a Republican is that in that impedes your ability to um, to raise money because people don't want to throw their money at a candidate when they look at the odds of, of that person winning. Uh, it, it, it's a it's very long odds. Um, and I'll just compare myself with Mr. Sessions, our third quarter fundraising, he raised 311,000 and change or something like 330,000, sorry, and change. 54% of his money came from corporate political action committees um, or other campaigns. Uh, and um, his average individual con contributor, uh, the average individual contribution was over $1,000. So none of my money came from corporate PACs. It all came from individual contributors. And my average donation size was about $69. So you can wow. see the very different constituencies that are supporting his campaign versus my campaign. Um, and it's, um, uh, again, those those PACs especially, they will not, and they use they use financial language. They don't say support a candidate. They won't invest in a campaign <laughs> uh, if they don't think it's going to win, right? So the, uh, the the language of campaign finance is almost like the language of, of, of um, venture capital, right? We're going to make an investment or we're not going to make an investment. And that's all the wrong dynamic. We really should 
be supporting in an ideal world, we would have fair districts that are drawn by um, nonpartisan citizen committees. And each candidate that gets through to the general election would get bang. Let, let's just I'm going to make up a number. One million dollars of public funding. And you guys go at it and may the best man or woman win, period. Um, and, you know, yes. level the playing field and get the focus back on policy and vision rather than I mean, if you look at the you look at the press, what is the first thing the press reports on? Joe Biden is out raising Donald Trump. Right. Pete Sessions out raised Rick Kennedy. This guy raised more money than any Senate candidate ever had. Beto O'Rourke raised more money than any Senate candidate raised in the past. Right. That is actually what the press reports on. And that should not be the focus of 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 our elections. Right. We should be focused on policy uh, and vision, not how much money people can raise. But that's the reality we live in. Yeah, that's a that's a great point, right? They yep. they talk. Did you did you? Um, yeah, Jamie Harrison, right? When they say fifty eight million. Yeah, he's raised fifty eight. You know, something like that. I, I guess yeah. that was a record quarter. Um, yeah, record quarter. Yeah, yeah. yeah. but you're right. Why it's bring it up? What's the what? You're. It's a ton of money. I mean, it's it's almost like. Where is it going to go? Um, I, I like the idea of a million dollars each, but I've also, this is something my friends and I have discussed, and I'm sure this will never become law, but of course, you know, a few glasses of wine, you like to throw around ideas. So, you know, <laughs> my, my thought was, why doesn't every citizen get an allocation from the government, let's say $100, that they can use to support their candidates that they want? Um, I don't know. I guess it's sort of the same thing as the million, but I like the idea of the million because it does make it completely fair. Everyone gets the same amount of money, same amount of support. Now let's talk about the issues, right? That, that should be the most important thing. That, that's what worries, I think, most residents or you know, citizens of this country or probably any country is if that politician's going out, who, really whose interest are they campaigning for, yeah. right? That, yeah. that's, uh, that's really the concern. And uh, do they mean what they say? And are they actually going to do what they say when they get in office? You know, th I mean, that's right. It's that simple. It, 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 it and you know to wax a little bit cynical right but we all know the answer to that question right <laughs> we 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 all know if you want to know who your representative in washington's going to going to work for when they get there follow the money trail that's exactly yeah. who they're going to work for um because yeah. it's that money trail that got them there it's that money trail that keeps them there um your idea of giving everybody a hundred bucks and say donate to the campaign of your choice that has a lot of merit too um because then you know you can the 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 candidate with a more compelling campaign is arguably going to raise more money and 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 will do better be, be be better able to communicate that has plenty of merit in and of itself some mesh between the two would be yeah. would yeah, be good you go. um you go. but you're right it'll never happen because the status quo favors the incumbents and uh, massively favors the incumbents so it's highly unlikely to to uh, that anything will change yeah that's t it's just this it's sort of like a machine, right? That's going, how do you stop this thing? How do we, it's a fan, right? Just, just rotating so fast. There's no way to get, get in there and, and stop the thing and make it go the other way or, or whatever. Um, this is probably horrible analogies, but I think you understand what I'm trying to say. No, it's, no, it's, I, I, yeah. I get it. And you know, yeah. what I tell voters is that it's, you know, I'm a candidate. I'm, I'm a private citizen. I'm not wealthy. I, I'm not even wealth adjacent. So, um, you know, I'm the perfect I'd be the perfect um, um, poster child for you, the voters sending the signal to Washington that we're done with the status quo. We're sick and tired of having our representatives chosen for us. We want this guy, not because he's a Democrat, but because he's one of us. Right. And he's coming yeah. from the grassroots. He's coming from the ground up. And that would send a signal to the other 434 members of the House of Representatives that, oh, maybe things are changing a little bit. You know, um, what's the old UT tagline? What starts here in Texas changes the world. I mean, what, what starts here in Central Texas could change, could change everything. Um, people always ask me, how am I going to make a difference when I'm in Congress? Just one guy out of 435 people. Um, and, it, you know, the, the real secret is, is not just one person, but adding weight back to the middle, the center of Congress. Congress is so divided right now, far left and far right. And again, I'm going to come back to gerrymandering, right? Because of, of those 87% of districts that are um, non-competitive, 
Those representatives are more concerned about getting a primary challenge from somebody further right or further left than they are. So they move their positions further right or further left. Uh, and con you can almost see Congress dividing, right? You can physically almost see it, right, over the yeah. last 20 years, especially. Um, and, um, you know, <laughs> it's not good for it's not good for our government. Uh, it's not good for just the basic function of government. If you look at the last 20 years, you realize that Congress has done almost nothing, right? Here comes campaign cat, by the way. Oh, I love Con it. I love Congress it. has done almost nothing. Um, the only two bills of significance that really impact the people were the Affordable Care Act and the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. One I say is affects us positively the other say affects us negatively but the, those are the major the major bills that have passed in the last two decades both of them passed when one party or the other held the house the senate and the white house they both passed under budget reconciliation so literally the narrowest possible alleyway for a legisl significant legislation to get through because congress is entirely dysfunctional and divided and just simply does not do its business like it used to do its business yeah, and that's sad because 330 million Americans pay for it, right? It's like absolutely, it, and it doesn't matter if you're red or left or conservative or liberal, whatever. It's we're all under the same roof here, all being affected uh, the same way. You know, that's the you sad part. Yep. And the the fighting's happening in the wrong place. I tell people all the time, friends of mine. I mean, right? We're in Texas. You're going to know conservatives, right? I mean, hello, absolutely. it's Texas. So, but I think that's the great thing about Texas is you learn to deal with people with other uh, beliefs pretty pretty regularly um, yeah. to be honest with you um, and, and I and I hate that because I'm always like that guys we should be fighting amongst each other we're all struggling to you know pay for our health care and and take care of you know our families and blah 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 the fact that we're fighting with each other I feel like that's what the you know the people at the top really want because if we're fighting with each other what does that mean we're not actually looking at the real problem I agree 100 percent <clears throat> you know, makes me sad. Yep. You know, I'm curious, Rick, what, what, you know, I, look, I'm, I'm super happy that you're doing what you're doing. I can't tell you, like you inspire me to be frank with you, but I also have to ask, are, is there something going on up here? Are you a little, <laughs> right? Is there, <laughs> <laughs> what would make you think <laughs> I'm, I'm doing question. this, <laughs> right? Like uh, what, what, why am I doing this? What, why an, am I going to put my whole life on the line for this? It's an entirely valid question. <laughs> <laughs> I, need to, I need to take that cognitive test that trump took yeah <laughs> um, um you know um there's a there was there's a certain level of um um starry-eyed wonder that hey i can try to make a difference here um uh, i ask myself the same question literally every day for the last three years i mean literally every day there's a moment every day where you think to yourself what were you thinking? I mean, it's sure there are moments where it's great fun and you're, you're, you, you have little brief, you know, blips of fame and all that stuff. Oh, I am on KBTX. That's great. You know, and, and there's, you know, there's, there's certainly fun aspects to it. Uh, I, I used to love knocking on doors and just starting conversations with complete strangers, which, which was entirely out of character for me. Um, but I found that's my favorite part of campaigning, but every day there's a point in every day where you go, ah, oh, this is just awful and and for me it's usually around raising money right just yeah. the the pressure to raise money and the knowledge that if you cannot raise money um that um you know this already tilted field just tilts ever more you know steeply against you if you if you can't raise the dollars to uh, to get your message out so yeah it's uh it, it it's it's not easy um it, it's exciting at times and at other times it's just a grind and um yeah underlying it all the motivation is that just you know maybe lightning's gonna strike just there's always the possibility that lightning's gonna strike and we'll pull off you know what 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 most people think is impossible to actually have a democrat win here in central texas oh man listen we need your hope we need you to feel that way you know like you're you're you sacrifice yourself in a lot of ways by doing it and uh you know there's a lot of people that you know, agree with you and support you and, and want to see you, you know, come to success. So, you know, I can say that, you know, you're making that sacrifice is a big deal. Again, it's very inspirational. I, I couldn't do something like that. I, I just, I would want to, but I just think one, I'm 
Nobody wants to hear from me, first of all. You know, that's why I think nobody <laughs> wants to hear from me. Uh, you know, what am, what am I going to do? Um, I guess there's a little, ar- a little arrogance mixed into the, in, into the, into the soup here. <laughs> no, but you need it. I actually it. thought somebody would actually want to listen to me. But I think you need that. You you felt you can make a change, and you went for it. You know, yeah, I exactly. I really I respect that. Um, you know, I you know you got to respect that. There's just something very very respectful about that. So, you ran before, right? In two thousand, yep. what was it? 18. 17? 18. 18. Okay, yep. eighteen. Um, mm-hmm. so you obviously felt well enough about that to say, I'm going. I'm going to go back at this, right? Were, were there? Was that the biggest when you made the initial decision to run? Was the second decision to run harder or was the first one harder? Which one uh, was harder? Um, first one was harder because it was it's really scary, right? Yeah, I yeah. mean, never being in the political game in any way whatsoever, you don't even know what to do. Yeah. Um, but I'll tell you one thing. Actually, filing as a candidate was one of the easiest things. I'm shocked. It was one of the easiest things I've ever done. You go on the FEC website, you fill out two forms, and boom, you're a candidate for United States Congress. What do you know? <laughs> <laughs> It sounds it, harder to get your license, right? It, like it I, is. It's you like... got to take a test. It's much harder. <laughs> um, but I'll tell you a story. Very, uh, you know, I I started this. I uh, there's no definitive date for when I started it, but I always use September 1st of 2017 because that's our. It was in there. So later in September of that year, I met with my first political consultant, and I told this person about what I wanted to do, and. Um, he looked me dead in the eye and said, okay, do you think you're going to win or are you setting up for 2020? And I, of course, said, oh, I'm going to win. Of course, man, we're going to go all in on this. And he looked at me and just pointed me right between the eyes and said, you're setting up for 2020. And he was, of course, spot on, uh, absolutely correct. It takes so long to to build uh, uh, relationships, especially in a, a district like this, it's almost, it's 7,800 square miles. I mean, it's just physically big. Um, and, and it's very diverse. As you know, you've got a slice of Austin and Pflugerville, but you've also got Bryan College Station. You've got Waco, you've got yeah. Fair, uh, you know, you got Fairfield and you've got rolling ranch uh, uh, lands and farmlands in between. So um, it takes a very long time to establish the relationships that you need to establish to talk to a all the people you need to talk to, to learn how to raise some money, um, to learn how to, you know, to learn what people want to hear, right? What they want to really hear about. Um, and that doesn't mean you, you compromise your, 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 your message or your, your principles to tell people what they want to hear, but it's more about how you're conveying your message. Um, you know, we learned something very, uh, very, um, uh, uh, disconcerting, if you will, I, in, in, you know, not too long ago, we did a poll and we, you test some messaging when you do a poll out there, right? And you, you throw this question out and you say, hey, uh, Rick's an engineer. Does that make you more likely, less likely to vote for him or do you not care, right? And it turns out nobody really gives a rat's ass that I'm an engineer. <laughs> that does not contribute to the, to the conversation at all. <laughs> you know, and if you had asked me three years ago, I would have said, hey, you know what? Uh, that's really going to appeal to people because they're going to want a logical thinker rather than this, this political baloney. But you know what? They don't care. They don't care. What what people really care about is is what's going to affect their day to day. What's going to improve their day to day lives. What's going to protect their lives and livelihoods, um, and and protect their concept of what America is. And it's it's voting is you know I I came at at it all as an engineer with logical approaches, and, and that still sort of forms the basis of my um, my policy. Uh, formulations, um, but people's voting decision is is ninety nine point nine percent an emotional decision, right? And and you've you've got to recognize that, and you've got to you've got to be able to learn to communicate along those lines, rather than well, you know, if I uh, if, if we um, if we simply cut down on our addiction problem, then this that you know this that and the other thing, uh, you know, the win 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 win. We we save lives. We take t- pressure off the border. We we deprive the cartels south of the border of a of a revenue stream. And if we do that, we increase the security environment, so we'll have less asylum seekers coming to the to southern border. So there's four wins by cutting down on our on our um, uh, addiction problems. But you've got you've got to find a way to to state that not as a uh, a set of dominoes that are going to fall but here's how your life 
Mr. or Mrs. Voter is going to be improved by by us investing in reducing our addiction problem. Wow, that is so interesting. Yeah, I can't imagine that that's just something you're going to learn over the weekend on your Kindle. You know, like it's, it's, <laughs> that seems like impossible. Uh, well, if you, you know, do, you're, it, if you do, you're a shoe in for the job. Yeah, that's for sure, yeah, but yeah. It's taken yeah. three years. Yeah, gosh, it would take. I'm me, still uh, not there. <laughs> you know, I would imagine it's something you're always learning. Well, that just shows a lot about you, though, and how you see things and how you see yourself. I, I think that's uh, that's very respectful. You know, being a politician, just period, right? No, no matter what what, uh, you know, what, what side you take, I feel like any politician starts in the eyes of just a regular voter already in a negative light, right? Because right. Politicians just aren't seen as trustworthy people. Right. And you yourself probably have that same feeling because that's why you wanted to get into politics, you know? So I'm curious how, how, what was your strategy in, okay, what, what are we going to do to, you know, fight that and what do you think you know is there something every politician can do or what do you think could help change that in the future or that's just not even something we can worry about it'll always be that way and you know i don't know i i i I, as long as we keep electing the kind of people we're electing it's going to stay that way that's for sure um you know i just try to be uh, first of all you just try to be authentic right just try to be me as much as possible um and and just try to communicate as as i would normally communicate with anybody uh but the biggest thing is and, and i'll circle back to something i said before um I, I i don't change my policy positions based on what i think people want to hear right if i just wanted to get into congress i would have run as a republican right i mean you, i mean if you really want to if you really want to like just brand yourself in some way simply to win, then you do it with the with maximum effect. Um, uh, but you, I've always tried to present myself as exactly what I am: private citizen, never held office before. I think Congress is broken. I think we need dr- drastic change in the kind of people that we elect. Uh, and by the way, I'm not going to bullshit you with. I'm going to give you something and it's going to cost you nothing, right? Oh, we're going to balance the budget and we're not going to raise anybody's taxes. <laughs> mm, yeah. You know, what kind yeah. of batteries do you have in your calculator, right? That's, <laughs> it's not going to happen. We're going to get rid of the deficit in the next eight years. No, I'm sorry. Our great, great, great grandchildren are still going to be dealing with the, with the pile of debt that we've piled up today. And, and I'm going to look you straight in the eye. And I'm going to tell you that's exactly what's going to happen. And not only that, because of this pandemic, we have to go further into debt. If we're going to keep American families whole, if we're going to keep small businesses intact, if we're going to keep employees connected to their businesses so that when they can reopen, it's it, it's a it's a it's a, a, um, a frictionless action for them to go back to work. The government's got a deficit spend. That's all there is to it. Or we just let everybody, you know, let one out of five, one out of six small businesses go roll over and die. And we let everybody uh, lose their homes and go on on food stamps. The 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 true fiscal sin of this pandemic is not the fact that we're spending trillions of dollars to try to buffer the impact on the average American It's the fact that we entered this pandemic already 22 or 23 trillion dollars in debt because of the lack of fiscal discipline that my opponent and hundreds of other people in Congress have shown in the last 20, 25 years. And again, because they were able to the the, the easiest thing for an entrenched or a career politician to do is pass a bill that has immediate positive impacts and all the negative impacts are 10, 15 years down the line. And we've been doing that for. 40 years now. Right. And yeah. it's it, you know, uh, you know, I'm sorry, folks, all your all your listeners, all your watchers. I'm sorry. Guess what? Nothing's free. There's no free lunch out there. Right. And yeah. and we're 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 taking we're taking lunches away from our great great grandkids right now. Um, and it's funny, I'm sure, to hear a Democrat ranting and raving about <laughs> about the debt. Um but, you know, I'll it's a be, real problem. It's a real problem. And guess what? I voted for Ronald Reagan back in the day because he was talking about how bad the debt was. Right. And it's, it's been a problem for me uh, at, for my entire adult voting life. Um, and it gets me going. What it, it really just gets me going that that people in office will make promises, just empty promises, like we're going to balance the budget and we're not going to raise your taxes to do it. And I, I'm sorry, it's just not going to happen. It's that's just an outright lie. Yeah, that's a tough. Um, 
I mean, you know, look, you, you, you see debates, you see politicians say, OK, th this is going to happen. That's going to I mean, we've talked about this, right? It's it's everybody takes things with a grain of salt. You just right. kind of do. <laughs> you I have mean, to. Just like, well, yeah, you kind of have to. Um, you know, it's just the way we've been trained in this country in a lot of ways. And um, I don't know what state or county is like would be an example of that not happening. I can't think of one. Um, you uh, know, it's right there. There's this not. It's just it's impossible, you know. Well, I, I look again, I'm, I'm really glad that you're doing this and, and what you got going. Um, you know, one big thing that I talked about with with Pete that I'd love to talk to you about is yeah. he health care. Yeah, um, that, that was definitely a big topic. And, you know, P Pete and I just did not get it. Did not we do not agree on on health care. Sure. And that's and that's fine. Um, I, I'm curious. I'm curious what your thoughts on on health care. You know, what, what do you think we need in this country? Well, it, and I, I try not to start with a solution. Right. We've got four big problems in healthcare right now. Yeah. Right. Not everybody's covered. Costs too much. Um, it, it's um, uh, your, your, your ability to get access to quality health care is um, is connected to um, your your employment for many of us. And um, we do have coverage or protection for pre-existing conditions, but it seems to be under attack constantly, right? Because it, I mean, let's face it, it's a money loser, right? For, for the insurance companies. So sure. I've always said that if you bring me, if somebody can bring me a healthcare proposal that has no government involvement at all, gets government entirely out of the healthcare business, that gets everybody covered, that preserves protections for pre-existing conditions, that lowers everybody's costs and breaks the link between employment and access to health care, I'll sponsor the bill. Okay, I will take that bill as far as I can take it. And if it needs somebody further up in the hierarchy, I'll give it to them and let them take it as far as they can take it, right? Because it solves the problems and those government resources will go use them to tackle climate change or immigration or border security or whatever the, uh, the million other problems that we've got to deal with, right? I just don't see that nobody's nobody's been able to, to create that, right? And, um, you, you know, we've had a quasi free market insurance um, uh, um, uh, uh, structure for the last since World War II, basically. And they've never come up with a product to address that that bottom 30 million, 20 million, 30 million, 40 million Americans that have always gone without health insurance. So um, the free market hasn't adapted, hasn't solved that problem. Government can. But again, I don't believe, you know, I'm, I'm not a guy who says government is the solution to everything. Um, my current proposal is a public option on to enroll in Medicare, um, regardless of your age. We can obviously it gets everybody covered, or at least gives them the option to be covered, right? Um, preserves protections for pre-existing conditions. Uh, we'll, we can reduce costs, right? We can, ro we can roll Medicaid um, uh, and CHIP into a comprehensive single Medicare uh, uh, voluntary or, or free enroll, uh, open enrollment Medicare um, and, um, and cons you know, save, save administrative costs by consolidating all of those um, uh, programs into one. And final, finally, we break the link between um, uh, employment and access to health insurance. So if thank you, you know, thank if, you. if, if yes. you're 35 years old and you're enrolled in Medicare and you want to take a risk and go start your own small business, you don't have to worry about health insurance impacts either for you or your employees. Yes. Uh, you know, if you want to, if you have a far off family member who has a, a medical condition is going to need long term care and you got to pick up and move across the country, you don't have to worry about losing your health care or a change in your health care. You're going to take it with you. It's freedom. It really is. And, yeah. you know, it doesn't take anything away from those 180 million or so Americans who are currently on private health insurance provided through their employer, it doesn't take that away from you. It just adds options. Americans don't like things being taken away by the federal government. I don't like things being taken away by the federal government, even if it's your 64 ounce big gulp or your pack of cigarettes, right? Even if it's bad for you, you know, <laughs> yeah. we don't want it taken away, but give us more choices, add choices to the pile and let us make decisions. Yeah. I love that. Uh, the, the employer connected healthcare to me is the biggest issue. Um, I just, uh, I, you know, I grew up with that. My father, this is why I told Pete, you know, my father was very sick my whole life. Uh, mm -hmm. Literally that, you know, when I was born, my father had just had surgery, uh, tongue cancer and had half his tongue removed, you know, the day I was born, he's holding me with bandages yeah. and he lived, you know, he just had a lot of problems my whole life until he passed away five years ago. And my whole life, he was 
with medical problems and affected our whole family. Absolutely. I mean, cons it was horrible, you know. So the way I grew up, it directly affected me. And I saw the way it affected my father, especially in the later years of his life where he was forced to work just to have health care. And he was forced to work a certain job just because of the health care that it gave him. That right? right, it was so ridiculous. And the fact that that exists, like my wife's from Spain. I lived in Spain for, for a few years. I'm a resident there. Uh, so I live with, you know, socialized medicine, sure. right? Universal healthcare, whatever you want to call it. Right. It's amazing. Anyone that tells you otherwise just doesn't know what they're talking about. I promise you, they've never been involved with it or something. Sure. Or they're yeah. reading something about it. They just don't know. It actually is a wonderful benefit. Um, it, it's, it's, it's that. It's that net to catch everybody that falls through to make sure. Because in Spain, the same thing. If you want private health care, you can have it. Sure. Nobody's t you, you can go get whatever, right? There's no, but you're covered. You, you don't have to worry about, uh, you know, your teeth, your eyes. Your, if you're sick, you don't have to worry about not going to the doctor. I'm right. from the restaurant industry and people in the restaurant industry, I didn't have insurance for years. Of course. And nobody yeah. did because you couldn't afford it. You were, and if you got hurt, you didn't go, you just banned it. And if you were sick, you know what I mean? You just like on the flat top, you yeah. get a cut, you're just like, zzz, just like literally singe it on the flat top because you, stitches, I mean, forget all that stuff. You never, you just couldn't afford it. And for the business to try to then offer uh, healthcare to the employees is an absolute anchor that you yep. can't get around. I had a small business in Austin running a food truck and catering and, and all that for years. And, it, and that healthcare is, I mean, expensive. It's, it's it's expensive. It's an anchor. It's almost will put you out of business. Like if right. you're zero to 30 employee small business, because that's real small business to me, I guess just because that's what I was in, mm -hmm. you know, 200 employees. That, that's not small business to me. That's like, that, that's a much different, but even then any business is forced to offer that insurance to them, which, which I think it's just something that should be offered the same way we offer Look, we offer military protection to protect our physical borders and physical things. Right. Why don't we offer military right. medical in a way, which is healthcare to me, to protect against those viruses on our American bodies, right? Like, yeah. I just don't get it. It just doesn't make any sense to me that we don't want to cover everybody. And, you know, the other the other angle I like to take on this um, uh, Sorry for the rant, by the yeah, way. Yeah, no worries, no worries. <laughs> yeah, you're in, you're you're in, you're in empathetic company here. Um, the other the other angle I, I like to take to uh, on healthcare is it's it's also an investment. It's an investment in our fellow yes. Americans, and therefore it's an investment in America, yes. because we all know healthier kids make better students, right? Better students grow up to be more productive in the workplace. Healthier adults are lose less time out of work, right? They, they're more productive in the workplace as well. Adult uh, parents of healthier kids lose less time out of the workplace because their kids, pandemic aside, <laughs> their kids, yeah. right? Their kids lose less time out of school. Um, so it, it's a, it's a sound investment. Um, and uh, it, much like education, it's an investment in our future. It's an investment in the 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 people who are going to keep this economy rolling when when we're retired, right? When when we're yeah. kicked back and relaxed and we're retired, you know, exactly. somebody's got to keep this economy rolling. Uh, and it's those folks who are in the school systems right now. Uh, it's those folks who are, who are, you know, working part time in restaurants without health insurance, etc. Uh, you know, and and those costs come home to roost at some point in time yeah. right and yeah. you know i even think the word insurance is the wrong word to use for health insurance because you know it isn't really insurance uh, you know homeowners insurance okay that's insurance because you may never actually file a claim right you might never get hit by a a, 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 um, a hailstorm or you might never have a fire in your house you might never file a claim with health insurance you're going to consume health care. That's all there is to it. It's really not insurance. It's prepaid health care is what it is. Yeah, oh, that's a good point. And, you know, we just, we, why are we so wrapped around the axle on this one? It's just, it's unbelievable. And, you know, you, you, you know, you said something, you, you said the word socialized health care earlier, right? And if you say that word with a certain set of people, it just, they just go. They lose you know, they, it. They reflexively react negatively mm -hmm. to it. Um, and that's all about the media environment that we're in. And, uh, you know, probably the, my biggest challenge as a candidate is not 
overcoming the messaging of, say, Pete Sessions. It's far more overcoming the messaging of Fox News and Breitbart and, and other right-leaning media outlets. I, I had a guy get, send me an email um, a few weeks ago telling me all the reasons why he wasn't going to vote for me. And <laughs> wow, he put some time into this. This, yeah. <laughs> this, was, wow. this was about two and a half pages of email telling me all the reasons he wasn't going to vote for me. And what really struck me is not that this guy wasn't going to vote for me. Right. There's 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 tens of thousands who won't vote for me. Um, but what he wrote, all those reasons he wrote have nothing to do with me. Right. They were they were the 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 media caricature of the the standard vision of of what you know, the media portrays, at least part of the media portrays as this is a Democrat, right? And it was clear this guy had never gone to my website. He knows nothing about me, never heard me speak, nothing, right? But he wasn't going to vote for me because I'm all of these things. And that's the biggest hurdle that we've, that, that I certainly as a candidate face. Yeah, that's tough. That's a, it's an invisible enemy of sorts, um, you know. With, yeah, with, infinite, with infinite resources. So With infinite resources. Yeah, yep. that's a good point. You know, yep. when somebody says, um, you know, oh, uh, you know, I, I don't, the healthcare, right? If somebody says, oh, well, I don't want to pay for someone else's healthcare. Why, why should I have to pay for this guy's healthcare? Why, why should I? I say, well, listen, I, I don't have kids, okay? I'm 40 years old. I've been paying taxes since I was 14, to be honest with you, since I had my first job at Albertsons, uh, you know, gr bagging groceries. Um, I don't have kids and I pay for public school. So get the F out of here. Okay. <laughs> and I say, and I say, I don't mind because like you, you made the point about it's for the health of our country actually to take care of everybody. It's a benefit. Same right. thing with education. I realize that. Yes. I want kids to get educated, even if they're not mine, because you know what, they're going to be taking over this and taking over that and be leader here and a leader there. And, and what, and I want them to be smart and educated, even if they're not my child. Absolutely. Right. So it's, a, it's the same, it's the same argument. I mean, in and, my opinion, you know, that that person who says they don't want to pay for somebody else's health care, they're probably in they probably have health insurance, which means they are paying for somebody else's health care. Right. Yeah. Like, that's a good point. You know, e even the, the basic the basic construct of insurance is 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 a and I'll say the word it's a socialist construct. Right. We yes. all throw our money in a pot every month. Right. And then when somebody gets sick, we have tacitly agreed that we're going to help that person out and pay their medical bills right out of that pot <laughs> so weird insurance is such a weird thing right it's like you're literally in business to try to avoid paying for the thing you're in business for exactly yep, yep. this That's is so strange and and i don't i don't definitely it doesn't fit in my brain i'm sure there's a reason for it but it doesn't compute in my brain why if you claim an insurance now your insurance goes up i'm like wait that's why i have insurance why is it going up <laughs> What didn't I have it for a reason? Yeah. Now you're penalizing me for using it. It's the Absolutely. It's, I, just, I don't get it. And I got friends in insurance. Shout out Joel Paparaki, insurance agent uh, up in Round Rock, actually. <laughs> uh, great guy, love him to death. Uh, you know, he helps out all the food trucks and stuff. Super great guy. I just don't understand the concept of insurance. Now he's a great guy. He he takes care of people, but. Um, yeah, it just uh, it just doesn't compute to me uh, the idea of insurance. But I like this whole healthcare plan, uh, the whole healthcare idea of not calling it insurance. I'm gonna start doing that. I'm gonna I, I like go. that a lot. I yeah. really do like that a lot. That that's a really smart way of uh, of looking at that because that's true. Um, what do you think about Texas turning blue? What do you um, think the odds of that are? I, I think the odds get better every year. I think um, the the. the the pundits and the, if you wonder why I keep looking down, because the stupid cat's in my lap. No, I got, um, I got two dogs that are right around. <laughs> Trust me, if they saw your cat, they'd be like, over yeah. here. <laughs> um, the, um, uh, the pundits uh, and, and the cheerleaders, you know, we, we've been calling this for, for several election cycles now. Um, you know, there's pretty consistent polling, at least at the top of the ticket, that has Biden pretty close. Um, and, uh, you know, I don't know how many... Um, Biden, Biden, Corn and Sessions voters there are out there, right? I, I don't know how many Trump, Hagar, Kennedy voters there are out there. Probably not too many of either, uh, of either class. Um, you know, I'll believe it when it happens. I believe that the potential is there. The turnout is just phenomenal. Yeah. Um, th the fact that we've got 1.8 million voters who were not registered back in 2016, um, and quite frankly. 
you know, from if you look at it from just the mechanics of running a campaign, those are all mystery voters, right? We don't know. We, we don't have enough voting history on them to know what they're going to do, right? If you're, if you've lived in Texas your entire life, and if you voted every four years, and you're in your 60s, we're pretty sure how you're going to vote this time around, right? We, we, we get that level of voting history. We know we can predict how you're going to vote. But these 1.8 million new folks, there's not enough history there on them to, to know how they're going to vote. So if they're all coming out, because they're ticked off at the dumpster fire that is our nation right now, uh, and they're looking for change, then it's the numbers are there, right? The numbers yeah. are there. Beto only lost to Cruz by what two hundred eighty thousand votes or something like that. So you know, the yeah, the numbers so the close. numbers are there. Yeah, it was it's, so close. it's a possibility. I'll believe it when. I wake up on November 4th and it has happened <laughs> or, <laughs> or November 5th or 6th or 7th. I don't know. Yeah. And, you know, yeah, one of those, right. one of the, whenever we find out for sure. Um, but, um, you know, we're certainly getting closer and I, I, I certainly believe the possibility is, uh, is there. Yeah. Look, my mom voted for the very first time, just this election. Mm -hmm. Very first time she's ever voted her entire life. My mom became a citizen. My mom's from Mexico. She became a citizen. I want to say 2001, somewhere around there. She was just yep. always a resident my whole life. And then just one day she was like, you know what? I'm going to I'm gonna become a citizen. Okay, great. Cool. Uh, didn't matter. Uh, but yeah, she decided she just can't. My mom is not a politician. I mean, she don't know yep. anything about politics. She was just like, this is not good. Uh, right. and I, and I, you know, and I need to do something. I need to step up and do, do something. And yeah, I think a lot of people absolutely yeah. feel that way in the same in the same boat yep yeah and they so. should uh rightfully so you know this yeah. 20, 2020 is i mean the craziest year right of just the craziest year you know uh absolutely it's been nuts um how have you been handling the, the pandemic as far as your family every everybody been okay everything? everybody's been healthy yep nobody no no we've um my partner sarah has a cousin who who's been pretty negatively affected survived but is has is one of these long haulers you know it's got some very long long-term negative effects um but we're lucky immediate family has uh, has all been healthy um we pulled the campaign off the streets uh on march 11th um uh, way back, you know, when maybe we wow. thought it was only going to be three months, right? Yeah. Um, you know, we, we pulled all volunteers and, and staff off the streets um, on March 11th. We've done very few, just in the last few weeks, we've done a few very small outside, very socially distanced type of events. Um, but you know, we've we've been lucky. We've avoided it. The the like I said, my my kids are taking classes remotely, um, not getting back in the classroom until we're uh, we're pretty sure that the the proper protections are in place, or or we've got a vaccine. Um, yeah. You know, yeah. it's it's you know it's nasty stuff, and we're in the middle of uh, you know we yesterday was the second highest total of the entire pandemic for new cases, and the death toll will rise accordingly in the next couple of weeks. Um, you know, we, when we're, we're talking about now we can talk about the number of people we've lost as fractions of a million, right? We're a significant fraction of a million. We're, 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 we're going to rapidly approach a quarter million Americans lost, um, to this. And, uh, it, it's just, it, it's a mind boggling number. And the fact that we are no better off vaccine aside, because we've, we've made progress on vaccines, but we're no better off on a day-to-day -day basis right now to test, trace, isolate, to provide the PPE that people need. We're no better off now than we were back in April. Uh, we, we, we've just been trying to ignore it for the most part. Um, and, and, you know, the, the, the mixed messaging that has come out of uh, various levels of government, whether it's, you know, the various agencies of the White House, you know, you hear the, the, the FDA and the NIH and the CDC are all saying different things and the White House is saying a different thing and members of Congress are saying different things depending on their political affiliation and governors, governors are saying and doing different things depending on, on, on their, um, again, on their political affiliation. Um, it, it's just a, a, a in a complete vacuum of leadership that this has gotten as politicized as it has. It, the fact that wearing a mask is a, is considered to be a political statement is, is, is just, just beyond the pale, right? It's just beyond Absolutely. the pale. Yeah. You know, uh, it's unacceptable. 
Yeah, it is. You're right. Uh, yeah. You know, it's funny. Um, very, just like it's in the March, I think. Yeah, it was in March. Right when the pandemic, I think just right after the lockdown happened here, when they implemented it, I mean, well, I had a molecular biologist on the podcast, and um, he's actually working for a company that's working with one of the vaccines at that mm -hmm. time. This was back in March, even. Yeah. yeah. And so it's a fascinating podcast because we're in October now, end of October, right? Literally everything he said that was going to happen has <laughs> happened. And it's a little scary because yep. he also said some other things that had me worried about come December and come January, yep. you know, with this this horrific winter wave, as he called it, right? This cold weather wave that was going to come. And just like I said, everything that he said every month is just like, I mean, he said the vaccine wouldn't come out till early 2021 way back then. Right. And right. that's still the case, even though Trump keeps trying to say, well, we're around in the corner and a vaccine's coming you know, next week or so. I mean, just like, it's just so crazy, but, um, you know, that, that disinformation as well is very dangerous it uh, is. in my opinion, Absolutely. right? Because you start to prepare the wrong way and you're right. The, the mass getting politicized is horrific. I mean, we're t literally talking people's lives. Yeah, so it's not, a, it's like, it's not a joke, right? It's not a game. It's like, no, wear your mask. This is not, I just, that's where we're at, you know, that, that's where we're at in this country. And, and it does make me sad, man. And I, I just, God, I, I pray for so much change to come on, on November 3rd. Yeah, let's, let's, uh, let's hope, um, you know, I, I, and while I would dearly love to win my election, of course, um, I believe, you know, the top of the ticket is, uh, is vitally important. Uh, and one rung below me on the ticket, the uh, Texas House Yes. Um, is is vitally important as well because you know one of the reasons why I face such an uphill battle is the fact that uh, the Texas legislature decided to draw me a district that um, was designed to elect Republicans ten years ago, and um, if the if both parties don't have a seat at the table in this redistricting year, um, then one one party or the other is going to face another decade of this baloney of um, you know having very few competitive congressional districts in, in in the state and it's unhealthy it's unhealthy for our democracy um I, I think we're we're unfortunately harvesting the fruit of of decades of this baloney uh and we really need to change course quickly yeah absolutely of course um rick look i won't take up too much uh more of your time but one last thing that we i figure we could end on uh, that would be good would be just for you to this is what I would, this is something I asked Pete as well, which sure. is, you know, what, what do you say to an undecided voter now in your race, right? Yeah. What, what's the last thing you're going to say to them? Two I, things. You know, 11 days left, right? So 11 days sure. left and you're still days, making up yeah. your mind. Two things you need to know about, about Rick Kennedy to, to, to put into your decision-making mill. Um, <clears throat> one is I'm focused on solving problems and to do so to improve the day-to-day -day lives and livelihoods of Central Texans to improve their their health, uh, our security, and um, uh, um, our prosperity. And I don't care where that solution lies on the ideological scale, right? If it's it, entirely no government involvement, I'm good as long as it solves the problem. If it requires intense government problem involvement, I'm good as long as it solves the problem. The second thing you need to know about me is nobody owns Nobody owns me, right? All of my contributions come from individual people. I have a very tiny fraction of my uh, my contributor uh, of my campaign fund has come from um, political action committees, and they're not even corporate PACs. It's one union PAC and a couple of what they call aggregator PACs, right? They're just just collecting money from a bunch of people and spreading it to a bunch of candidates. So, you know, a tiny fraction of one percent of my uh, campaign funding comes from PACs. Ninety-nine point nine percent comes from individual people, just like you, Mister Undecided or Mrs. Undecided, um, and. As I said back earlier in the in the in the cast, if you want to know who your representative in Washington is going to work for, look where the money's coming from. My money's coming from people like you. That's who I'm going to work for. Bam. Love that, Rick. Oh, gosh. Well, look, I, I absolutely wish you the best in this race. Uh, Thank there's you, no sir. Doubt, no doubt about it, man. I'm going to be rooting for you. And um, 
you know, we'll, we're going to get this podcast out. Absolutely. Of course, before. Yeah, right. Uh, definitely yeah, before, before. Before November 3rd, I hope. <laughs> of course. You know, I was talking to your, uh, who, who I was setting the interview up with this. And that's the first thing they said. Well, yeah, be, you know, it needs yeah. to come out before the election because I don't see a point. I'm thinking, <laughs> I, I agree. Trust me. I agree. I don't know why. We're, uh, we're thinking a Christmas release date uh, yeah, somewhere right. around there. Does that? Uh, this, is, this is the guy you could have had. <laughs> yeah, this is. <laughs> Look what you missed. Look what you meant. That is hilarious. Well, again, Rick, uh, <laughs> I really appreciate you taking the time, man. I, I know, uh, you know, I w wish you the best going into the weekend. And again, wish appreciate you the best it. with this race. And uh, my best to you and your family staying safe uh, during this time. You too. And I appreciate the opportunity. Thanks. The Lone Star Play podcast is produced by Texas Real Food. Go to TexasRealFood.com and you can search your city for stores, butchers, restaurants, farmers markets, and more who are using fresh, artisanal organic sources it's a fun site that brings all natural options all together i hope you enjoyed this episode for more information go to the lonestarplay.com i'm your host patrick scott armstrong until next time <laughs> <laughs>